afternoon and welcome to the Reflective Coach Podcast with Coach Luca. I was delighted to bring on American coach Kat Nichols. It was fantastic because as I was arranging this with Kat, it literally took a matter of an hour and the next day she was on and we were having this fantastic episode in amongst her life and what is going on. But it's about finding that time which she made and I'm really so grateful for what she has done by making that time and really coming on the podcast. I really enjoy talking to Kat in terms of our experiences and working with different groups, different types of players, adapting sessions and sometimes taking a step back in terms of what really benefits the players and what works for them. We don't have to be 100% in control of each and every session, we don't have to control each and every second or minute and sometimes taking that step back in just an hour now players and having 30 second conversations or little timeouts in sessions where we can talk to our players can really be important because there could be so much affecting the player from their day in terms of what's going on, in terms of what may have gone on previous session, how they reflected on a game, their psychology could be completely different or their output, their perspective. There's a number of external and internal circumstances that could impact the player and we have to really be on top of our game and really be aware of this. And sometimes just having those 30 seconds while we're putting out cones and just having that conversation can really be beneficial. It was great to speak to Kat as she's obviously so approachable, really loves coaching and the groups are very lucky to have her. There's so much within this episode and it was great that Kat could be so organised and get on and I really appreciate it. I enjoyed this episode and I hope you do as much as I have. So please drop a like, drop a follow, drop a subscribe, drop a comment. You can do this on YouTube, Spotify, Anchor, LinkedIn and Twitter. It is TRC Podcast underscore on Twitter. It is the Reflective Coach Podcast everywhere else. I really appreciate Kat coming on, as I've said now, but I, again, enjoy this episode. This is the Reflective Coach Podcast by Coach Luca. You okay? Yeah, yeah I'm good. We just got, I just got back from Portugal. Oh, wow. What, holiday or just time away or? Um, a little bit of a holiday and my stepdaughter was there for international friendly with US youth football. So I traveled for 26 hours with flight delays to get back here to go coach in a tournament in four days. That's, that's some commitment mind to, to go abroad for not only travel for your stepdaughter, but then to rush back and try and get back for your own kind of games then. It's, it's the life right. of a coach, you know, and, and a parent. <laughs> it is for sure, but I would do it all over again. It's fun. And it's great experiences, you know, going abroad and, and doing that. I suppose it's better going abroad than being stuck across state, I suppose. <laughs> it's, fun. it's fun. I just like to travel, so it was it was a fun experience. And I'd never been to Portugal before. I think I've been once as a young kid, and I'm hoping to go back in 2023 on a holiday. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely a nice country. So Yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. So, what part of the USA are you? Uh, what state are you in? I'm in, I'm in Alabama, so I'm in the South. Oh, cool. So, uh, America's so cool because there's so many different states. You go to one state, it can be so different to the other. Right. Right. <laughs> my best it's very, mate, very different. My best mate moved from Wales. He currently lives in uh, California. And he's always texting me, say, come out here, come and get a job, come live with me, kind of thing. And he's, <laughs> he's really selling it to me. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very different. California is very different than Alabama, for sure. But even then, going across America, the, you know, the kind of football and the differences, are, you know, it's it's one of those where you could be out for years and years as a foreign coach like myself and just adore what America is and how yeah. different yeah. and diverse it is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Like I grew up in Texas, and the soccer, the football, football in Texas is way different than it is in Alabama. And even going like two hours. Start east, east to Georgia, Georgia, it's completely different. And I was going to say, you know, that might be one of the things, because America is so big and, you know, so many states, it it might be so different compared to some in, in the south compared to the north in just a few hours difference. And it must be so yeah. difficult yeah. to regulate and, and impact the game across such a big country in that aspect. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. And I know here in Wales, we've just implemented a new high-performance program strategy. So it's trying to um, in, instill what, what the standards of the national governing body are right across Wales to make sure they're all the same. Obviously, we're a really small country compared to America. So I suppose right, right. doing that in America would be so difficult. Um, and you can sort of, you know, in the World Cup, you saw America, they're building a team for the future and they've done quite well. Um, but it must yeah, be difficult yeah. from the grassroots stages in, in some elements in, in that aspect. 
Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. For sure. And every, I think, feel like everybody has their kind of like different mindset and different thought process on how the game should be played. And it's no, no like streamline across the board. Like you like pep, you like your game, you like this fight, you like this style. There's no like consistency across the board. It's just whatever you like in your club life and what your club model is, you kind of go for it. And it's, it's 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 great to have those different perspectives because then it can create so many different challenges and uh, such a wide range of coaching and, and different aspects within the game for players and certainly the opportunity for coaches. But um, when it comes down to that sort of thing, it, it can be quite difficult then when you have those differences when you come up against different coaches. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Like even in our league, we play like we play a team out of South Carolina, might be the North, the North Carolina, Carolina team, but they're. It's always, it's always like, like a chess match, match when I play them. Like, he'll make a move, and I'm like, ah, oh, I see what you now did. Now it's my turn to make my move. And we play, like, it looks like we play very similar styles, but it's also vastly different. So then you go play a team from Texas or SoCal, and it's different. And the way they coach and, like, the verbiage they use is slightly different. Um, like, the whole back foot, front foot, lead foot thing is very different here. Where I say lead foot, to other people it's back foot. Um, so, just so just verbiage, language, language, language across the board is vastly different. different. And, even and even like within the state, like club, club to club in the state is vastly different in the way they play. And are we, and are we developing for the future or are we developing to win games right here, right now? And that's so it's kind of, it kind of makes it fun. And that's what it can come down to is, you know, that difference then in terms of that approach, that attitude and what you're trying to develop and, and, and you know, what the different outlook from a coach can be. Um, and it can become so competitive then and so great, but then it can be obviously that real clash between coach to coach at times because of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Whether it's you know results driven or player development, and it's it's whether it's that fine balance in terms of what that different outlook is. So, for example, here in Wales, it's all about development football. How much can we create? And we've suspended uh, competitive up until a later age now. And I think that's the plan for the FA is to keep pushing that back until they're older. Whereas the FA in England, they're like, right, we need to start competitive football from under sevens. So it's going to take five years for us to see that difference to really understand the results. But obviously, as you can see, England develops so many great youth players and we're quite behind in terms of Wales in developing the youth products so it's definitely going to be interesting to see whether that works but uh, you know off your facial expression end to start a competitive under sevens is just sometimes mind baffling yeah yeah it's mind-blowing I don't know how I feel about that to be honest like let, let the kids play I don't feel like it needs to be super structured that young like just let them give them a ball and they'll play they'll figure it out um that's kind, That's kind of what we do in our football, football uh, program that my husband runs and started. Is half the, the first half, half like here's a ball, go play, figure it out, figure out, figure out your team, team, figure out your subs, make, make it even, make it competitive, and to watch, and to watch them like take ownership of it. I feel like, like we did that more, especially at the youth ages. How much of a difference would that make in our younger kids as they develop? Because now you have to figure it out, and it's not so structured. And that's what it's all about, you know, it's about them finding their own way because sometimes as coaches we can have too much input and too much dialogue in terms of what we want from the players and then they can become sort of robotic in that own sense whereas it is about finding their own way, about finding what works for them and what doesn't and then how we can tailor it to meet their needs, for example. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think we have to create like more free thinkers because obviously as coaches we're not all on the field playing with them, right? Like I can't get out there and do it for you. You have to understand and make your own decisions, so... If we structure, if we structure our, our sessions in a way that let them be free thinkers and not always so structured and it has to be this way or that way, I just would love to see, like, I know my team just made a difference, but, like, if we did it more readily around the world or even around the country, like, how much of a difference would that make in our footballers? And being able to step out and play. And it's great for them that you allow players to go out and have that freedom to play and think for themselves so they can have their own approach and, you know, learn for themselves while they got the ball at their feet because, you know, it is their game. And, and as I was speaking to another coach last night, you know, we are playing with the lives and time of, of young players that they can't get back again. And they want to enjoy it as much as learning. And, and it's that fine balance which is important. But just going out and playing it is part of their own journey and something that they must do and, and certainly have available to themselves. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it comes down to it. when it, it fits in nicely with what the Reflective Coach podcast is because it's all about reflections, all about growing, all about how we can approach it in different ways. 
but some coaches they cannot relieve their element of structure and their hands on and the amount of control that they have within sessions and over their players and you know even for new coaches starting out is is a reflection point for them you have to let go and you have to just go against what might be on the inside where you're you're burning up because you don't have that control but just let it go and just have that enjoyment and just sit back and watch the kids play you don't have to be giving them you know technical instruction for every minute of every session yeah yeah i agree, I agree. So, it's and, a, I and i feel like that's a vulnerability issue, issue well. as well like if you, if you take your control, your control out of it now you're, now you're showing you're maybe where your your deficits are as a coach and where you lack in helping the kids kind of understand what they're doing and how to process and now you're you've become vulnerable and your weaknesses are shown and we haven't forbid if we show weaknesses so um that's been my big thing is like how vulnerable can i be when i coach and i lead my players because they need to be okay making six too and then that just helps me as a coach get better if i allow those mistakes to happen because then i can go in and structure the next session okay this is where we struggled now how can we fix it and that's a vulnerability on, on my behalf as a coach as well, right? Like, I wasn't perfect where I thought I nailed it. And I was like, yes, I got this. And then when the session happens or the game happens, it's like, whoa, that was not what I was thinking. And then you can go back in, go back to the drawing boards and redo it. But that vulnerability piece, even as coaches, I think you have to be more willing to have and show that um, to get better out of our players. And I truly love that, and that's just certain little notes that I'm making as you're speaking, is vulnerability. <laughs> and I truly love that. I think that's just going to be one of the key elements which I'm going to take away and certainly put out there. But when we when it comes down to coaches, a lot of coaches, as you say, don't like to show that vulnerability. So it's about creating that environment, that context, where we're both in it together, players and coaches, and there's nothing wrong with making those mistakes together. And if you create that atmosphere, that environment where you can do it together, then you're going to learn collectively and you're going to have more trust and a better relationship with your players as a result of it, I believe. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I think, and I think that's, that's the big part. part. Players, players know that you're vulnerable, they're more willing to be open and vulnerable as well, but they also will then start playing for you because they're like, hey, they can show their true colors, they can be themselves, and it's okay. She just made a mistake, she owned it, I can do that too. And then the, the relationship you build from that aspect and then how they end up turning and playing around for you because you've been real with them and you've treated them like people instead of like players. Like That's huge for me is making them people first and then players second because ultimately soccer for most of these kids especially in the u.s is probably going to take them through college and then that's that's it some maybe not even to college so it's their character and who they are as people that's going to last in the rest of their lives and i think that's the biggest impact that we can have so if we can teach them to be vulnerable be okay making mistakes and learn from it and how do we move on and how does that make it better then i feel like that just sets them up as a person down the road as they go out into society Another key concept there is person player and you know how they go out in society because uh, again I was talking to another coach recently and it's about that player aftercare and sometimes it's not there and when a player comes to the end of their line and their footballing career is up or there's no more scholarship or that's the end of their route for them it's about what they then have available to them as a person in terms of that skill set that experience uh, what they've learned along the way because they're going to go on and continue to live their lives and if they can apply the skills and everything that they've learned from a soccer or football or sporting context then it's so important for them and, and it's how as we teach them and how we coach them and have those abilities to because you know it can be hard to have those vulnerabilities but if they, as a child they can show them and then as an adult they can also show them it's going to create that dialogue which then can you know uh, coincide and support mental health issues which you know relate to vulnerability and, and that stigma in terms of not showing that side for example yeah, yeah sure. for sure and it all Agreed. comes down to that big picture which is so important and as you say when the players play for you they, naturally they're going to take their own ownership in terms of their game their own learning as a result of it um, and it's great that we can create that two way street uh, which can be so important then but it's, it's great that those environments can be created and I think for any coach listening it's really important for them to understand that these environments can be created and there's nothing wrong in doing so yeah yeah I think that's, I think that's breaking, breaking that stigma down, down right? Because we've, we've grown up and it's been like, no, it's got to be this way, it's got to be this way. You have to be perfect. You have to be the strong arm of the law when you just kind of relax and be in it with the players instead of hovering from 900 feet and dictating to the players, getting down in the, in the bunkers with them. 
and doing, and doing it, it, it makes it a completely different experience for them, for them and for you as a coach. And that's what it comes down to is some some coaches that they spend too often dictating to their players in terms of how things should be and what should be and it should, it's too regimented at times and the players have different personalities they don't all want to be there not all 30 of your players if you've got 30 players want the same outcomes you might have 10 who want to become professionals 10 who are happy to be there and then the other 10 who have mixed differences in terms of they do it alongside other sports etc so it's understanding those different personalities and those different player types which is so important when it comes to your group and, and managing and coaching your players for example yeah, yeah for sure and it's managing those personalities and how can you make them all mold into one and make it work as a unit as you go forward and again with that vulnerability piece like if players are vulnerable with each other and vulnerable with you that just I feel like makes them closer as a team and now you've built those relationships within your team that then carry it hopefully carry out onto the pitch as you're starting to play games and they're there for each other and yeah, we're going yeah, to be competitive in games and we want to win. But at the end of the day, like, I know one of my teams will come off the field and be like, hey, it's okay. Like, I know you missed that, but go get it next time. Or if there's a mistake on the field, they'll be the first to be like, hey, head up, let's go. Let's go get the next one. Um, and just kind of setting that tempo and that motto from the beginning. Like, it's all right. We're going to fail. We're supposed to fail. We're human. That's what happens, right? But how can we step forward together as a team? And, and if we set that, that precedence in practice, practice and we set that, that in training and how we go about things, things I think it just carries over. And, and it helps them, even, even like in life, like, oh, I failed the test. Oh, well, I'll do better on the next one because at the end of the day, you're not going to get a redo on a test. You got you to gotta figure it out and move on and learn how to deal with it, which I think is huge for kids these days. But I mean, I don't know how it is in Wales, like here, like academics are pretty high priority. So making sure that they know it's okay. Like, like obviously we don't want to fail classes, we don't want to fail tests, but if you struggle with something, that's okay, because it, within that struggle is where you're going to find greatness and where you're going to improve, not only as a student or a player, but as a person. And there's so much within that, and it's, it's there's so many different key messages, and I think it's great that it is about finding that greatness, regardless whether you've had failure, regardless how many times you have to jump over the hurdle, there is going to be greatness at some point, and it's about coming together collectively, and if you can do that within a training session, and build as a team, and you put your arm around each other and say, that's okay, and then you, you transfer what it is from training into a game, it can be so important, and as you say, it's great to try and have that competitive edge, and also you want to win games, but if you're losing a game, and then suddenly the high performers of your team, and the most technical players are then falling out with the less technical players because they're like all right it might be your fault and then cracks start to appear and then it can be really difficult to realign your team whereas when you have that collective attitude um, and something that you instill then when you do have those losses and put your arm around each other it's the more important thing about going do you know what we they're taking again that ownership and they become leaders in that sense but they then develop all those other skills such as compassion teammanship care they want to be around their players and it's like let's go again let's realign and we can keep performing and it then comes down to that balance in terms of how you appease all those different personalities which as coaches it can be such a difficult job in in those elements at times oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah, oh, yeah. for sure, for sure. Managing, managing all the different personalities you have, you have. I wanted my teams, like, I have a hyper-competitive kid, like, any game, any training session, like, activity we do, like, they want to win, they want to be the best, but sometimes I kind of play devil's advocate, and I put them with the kid that's not quite as competitive to kind of tone it down, like, yeah, we want to win, we want to compete, but it's not an end-all, be-all if you lose one activity in a training session, it's okay, so, like, having to manage that. Um, I think, I think takes the picture not just for me as a coach and helps me like through that struggle. Like, hey, we need you to calm down. It's okay. Like, it's a rondo. It's okay that they got four passes and they got a point and you got split. Like, it's not the end of the world. Um, but then having that person to kind of kind of balance counterbalance them, um, I feel like kind of brings them back down to like, yeah, we want to win. We want to we want to play. So managing all those different kinds of personalities because as you said, like we have. The hyper competitive. I want to go to college. I want to go pro. Then, the, hey, I'm doing it because I love soccer. But at the end of my high school career, I'm done. Is hey, I'm just out here to be out here, and whatever happens, happens. Um, so managing all of that and building a team through that, it's it's difficult and fun and a trick as a coach that you have to kind of manage just the personalities as well. And it's 
really important there to have someone who can compliment someone with that really competitive attitude because you know when they are really competitive all the time it can drive higher standards within the group especially for the players who are a bit who are a bit le less technical and uh, have that uh, lesser outlook towards that competitive edge but sometimes having that player can really then help the competitive player and just calming it down a little bit and going do you know what we don't have to win every training session every training session doesn't have to be really intense we can have fun and it's that difference where I've definitely found along my journey and something that I reflected on is not every session has to be really intense it's about that fine balance it might be intense this week might just have a bit of fun when it comes down to it next week and it's about remembering what group you're with and, and, and trying to give that enjoyment back to them as much as leaving that session as a coach going, do you know what, I enjoyed being in that session myself because the moment you stop enjoying coming away from sessions as a coach, it can be so difficult. Right. Right. And then, and then it makes it hard to go back out the next day. If you're like, oh, I hated being out this day. Then it just it's almost like a snowball effect. If you have one bad session, you don't want to be there. Then you don't want to get ready for the next one and then the next one. So trying to find that balance for sure as a coach. Which I've, Which I've struggled been, with. Like, I know, like, I'm just accepting as a coach. Like, even on our fun days, days like, I still, I'm like, hey, let's train, let's be focused. And then I'll catch myself and be like, no, like, let them be kids, let them have fun, let them play soccer tennis, let them play cross bar challenge. It's okay. Like, they just had four months of straight, like, three day a week training. Let them be kids and let them have fun. Just take a step back. So I have to catch myself too because I am that hyper competitive person and I want to win. But like having those moments where I have to catch myself and pull myself back, like, nope, it's okay. They're laughing, they're enjoying it. Just let it happen. Um, that's been kind of hard for me as a coach, but I've tried to do better at it and I'll catch myself. No, 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 nope. You do what you want to do. You do it. That's fine. That is totally fine. You know, like. So even, so even as a coach, having those moments where it's okay to let loose and let them have fun, and you can have fun too, because at the end of the day, if we're not having fun doing what we're doing, what's the point? Absolutely, and that's what it comes down to, and it's great that you sort of have that open, honest reflection with yourself during a session. You can see that and allow those elements to happen where it is fine, it's completely okay to do this, because I know many coaches who wouldn't let certain things slide because they, they have to have that control, but it's great that you have it and you see that and go, do you know what, they are kids and they have to have fun, and it takes me back to sort of when I deliver the session, it'd be Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock at night, in the freezing cold during winter, it's dark, it's wet, it's muggy, the players are tired where they've been in school, all day so it's like right what do we do with them on a wednesday the best thing is for them to just play games for the hour just get in get warm have a little bit of fun then they can go home for half between seven and half seven then as young players they got an hour to chill out and then mostly go to sleep and it's remember it was down to young players in their ages as well as that they are players training but we're meeting their needs whereas then i was looking at the team next to us same age um, and they were from a different club and they had all the hair dolls out they had every fitness equipment i was like <laughs> it's winter it's six o'clock at night why do they need to be doing this yeah yeah which I think is it's hard as a coach, right? Like we always we want to set up and get prepared for the next game and the next this and we gotta win and we gotta be focused. But realizing like we need breaks too as coaches. Like we need to let loose and have a little fun. If not, we're gonna be stressed out all the time. And the kids need the same thing. So I think it's the lost art. I feel like and it's it's hard. Like I know I struggle with it as a coach, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Of it's okay to have a fun day to let them play whatever ridiculous games they want to play just to let them have fun they're with each other they have a ball they're playing and that's what really matters and there's especially like my group we had a soccer olympic day two weeks ago before we broke for holiday um and we played soccer olympics and there was like a heading competition and soccer tennis and crossbar challenge and it was just fun like they enjoyed it they were laughing um, they, were, they were they were playing, they were competing, but it was, but it was a fun competition, not like, oh, I beat you, but there's trash talk and talking smack to each other, and it just made it fun to where I can just step back and be like, I really love what I do. And that's, that's hard as a coach, right? Because we always want to prepare for the next game because we want to win the next game so bad, but even in those moments where we have those kind of relaxed sessions, it almost benefits us going into the next game because now they're relaxed and they're comfortable and they're playing and they're energized and they're excited to be there. And that's going to translate onto the, onto the game field from game day. And, you know, that translation is really important and it's such a key word there is 
that how does it translate on a game day and you know it's really important to have that and I know when I spoke to my mate he played really good he played a good standard of football over here in Wales he played for Newport County he then had a scholarship and then he had an injury and then went out to Canada and tried to pursue it but now he's come back he is playing sort of grassroots football and he is 26 years of age and although he's now in seniors football I know um, you were saying the other week oh why do we have to do a fitness session why can't we just have a bit of fun why can't we just play a game and now he's 26 and played a very good standard of football but he's uh, even at that age is going well why can't we just have a bit of fun why can't we just have a bit of a breather we don't want to be doing fitness sessions week in week out and it, it puts right. in contrast from even then when you're talking to an adult at that point to then coaching a young kid that same momentum in terms of that enjoyment still is sustained right up until they are adults and they just want to play football at the end of the day and they don't want to be grafted and don't have to be all the time yeah yeah even in our some of our sessions, like I feel like the most joy coming away as a coach when I, the player comes off the field at the end of the session. Like that session was great. I loved that session. Now I'll be like, yeah, I did it. Yes, let's repeat that. Um, that like, with, I feel like we have to listen to our players. Like they're gonna tell us what they want and what they need, even if they don't come out and say like, hey, coach, we're really tired. They can just chill, like have a chill session. Their body language and like the way they move, like that's gonna tell us. Ask coaches, coaches what, what they need. Um, so, I so I think we have to be very aware and attentive to like, the way our players are acting and the things that they are doing because you, you want them, like, like even at 26 years old, old like, you know, when we get tired, like, I'm way older than 26, so like, you can tell when I'm tired. So, like, if we can see that as coaches, like, oh, look at little Susie over here. She is not having it today. Like, maybe we need to adjust the session or the whole group is just kind of like zombies walking around and let's adjust. And that, and that makes, makes them want to be there, makes them want to have fun. But I think we have to be a little bit more in tune as coaches to what how our players walk out to the field. What kind of energy do they have? Are they just kind of sitting around, not getting ready? Are they up, their boots are on, and they're on the field, knocking them around, they're ready to go. And that tells you big things on how your training session needs to be ran. But we, I mean, I'm not perfect at it, but I've, it was brought to light uh, meeting with one of my mentors, like, hey, how's your session going? I was talking to him. And he's like, what were your players firing? Which is like, like what were they telling you? And it was like that aha moment. I was like, oh, I probably should be more observant about that. That makes sense because they were telling me not to have a hard day. And I was trying to have a hard day because I felt like that's what they needed. But they didn't need that in that moment. So if we can be more attuned to that and what they're saying without what they're actually saying, right? Because body language and all that speaks way louder than sometimes their words do. And I truly love that. And it's about being in tune to that energy and, and understanding and seeing those players and just sitting back and watching them. Um, and that's what I've always tried to do when I set up my sessions is sort of have it set up. And then when the players are coming in, I can talk to the assistant coach, but we can just have that conversation. But as we are, just watching the players, how they are, how they've come in, how they're preparing, how they're getting along amongst each other in a unstructured capacity where they have the opportunity to do some passing but then they might go and do shooting even though they knew that wasn't what was expected but it just allowed right, me to right. observe what their needs were and as coaches a lot of them don't have that awareness and I know I work in education and I do a lot of coaching that when I observe a lot of other professionals they lack these skills of awareness when it comes to young people and what their energy is and they don't always look at what could be affecting them or why they might be reacting like that or why they're not at their optimal performance levels and that's because they haven't just given in that minute or two just to look at the young people in front of them um, and to understand why they, they aren't performing the way that they should be or as expected and then suddenly they don't perform certain ways and then they're disciplined for it well no if you just took that minute or two just to observe your players and understand them even better you're going to get a lot more out of them and certainly give them that support that they're looking for yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I know it's hard. Like, I don't know. There's some coaches in the U.S. that like, coach like I do, but I have three sessions that run back to back, and there's like an overlap. So they're in charge of kind of warming themselves up. But like in that moment, during that overlap time, I'll send one team out for water, and I just kind of take a minute or two to watch what's happening with the next group coming up, and that tells me all I need to know. But it took. I mean, this is my 18th year of coaching, and it's taken me probably 16 years to like start to actually realize that moment but i think if we can do it um and coaches can be more attuned to that it's going to make a difference not just in your training session but in your players lives like and how they feel and their excitement to come back out to the field you know and we want to create that excitement where they do come out back into that field and we want to support them because 
players' motivations, like as we said, in terms of hours, may fluctuate and they have a lot of different factors going on internally and externally within their lives. And they might be in there for their different personality types. And then one week they might really want to be there and be the best player. Then the next week they're like, oh, I, oh, I don't really want to be here. And I've, I have a perfect player in my mind right now, which I can really relate to because week to week he had such a different personality type that he was wanted to be the best and next week he wasn't so bothered um but that i think he had a lot more going on but it was how we understood right. if he wants to kick a football around this week and he's not bothered about the competitive result well let's just let him kick a ball around and then let's try to realign his focus for the week after because he's going to get a lot more enjoyment yeah. of kicking that ball around this week rather than me screaming at him going right get, go do the warm-up go do this do that just adapt to the yeah. needs and allow your players to have that bit more freedom, which can then really meet their needs, as you keep saying. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And that's what it's all about. It's, it's that person-centred, that, that human side, and we forget that they are humans and they are young people, that we ha- they, they have that human nature, whereas we forget that there is players' performance, high optimism, uh, optimal output, and all, this other, all these other factors which are continuously ingrained in, in what we want from uh, you know, players within a competitive standard, but at the end of the day, we need to look at that nature, nurture, that development, that guidance, and creating that fine balance, which is great. That coaches like yourselves realise that and and instill within your sessions, because you know, if you compare your team to a, a team that is competitive, every training session, every game over a season, they're going to be so burnt out. Whereas your players will probably end up having a lot more success personally and as players, as well as a group, compared to a team that's been pushing hundred percent. All year round, right, right, yeah, yeah, a thousand percent. And I think what we don't, we kind of fail to realize too, is like they have lives away from the soccer field and not just at school either. So there's 800 things going on, and now they have technology and social media. And what did somebody say or what comment did somebody leave on their post that now like has this crazy effect on them? So they have way more than when I played. Like we had cell phones that didn't really have our screen was like this big and you couldn't even play games on it right so like there's no, no such thing as social media so i don't have to worry about that stuff but now they're coming out to the fields they're on their phones they're on tiktok they're on snapchat people are saying stuff people are talking about them boyfriends just broke up with we have all of these different outside external influences coming onto the field with each different kid and how does that impact not just, not just their, performance their performance as a player, player but then as a person. person. Like, that's, like, that's pretty, pretty heavy stuff that like, we didn't have to deal with. I know I didn't have to deal with it as a player coming up, but that's something we have to take into account as well. Like, my girls play high school soccer, but they have preseason during the fall, and then their actual seasons in the spring. Well, their preseason is my actual club season. So they're training, and they come into practice and training with me. So how does that take into effect? And then they're all, like, super smart kids, like, all have like straight A's, but they're stressed about school. Like they have huge tests coming up, or my boyfriend just broke up with me, or my best friend is thinks my boyfriend's cute. Now they're talking. All these different things, these external influences that are things we have to read as well, right? So we're not just reading them as a player, but them as a person. Like what what are those external influences that are having an impact as they come out to the field and show up at the field? Maybe they got a flat tire on the way to practice, and they've already had a bad day. Like, like that player, player may need a little extra attention that day, but are we, but are we as coaches like attuned to that and like keeping, keeping that in the back of our mind that they're not just here to perform as soccer players? players. Like they have so much other other stuff going on. Like you and I have other stuff going on outside of being a soccer coach, and that does influence and impact our mood and the way we step out to training. But can we leave that in the parking lot and step out on the training field and have that day? But as coaches, we have to be. um Aware, aware of the situations within our players and just kind of cognizant of what's happening and what they're bringing out because it, it might not be they just are having a bad soccer day there could be so many other things going on that's leading to that bad day and that's what it comes down to it you know and i think a lot of coaches lack that overall skill set in in terms of understanding that there is a lot more going on and it's not just a bad day and it's about those signs and seeing that where you know one player might have fallen out with another player and as your assistant coach may not have realised that, but you may have that inkling of, all oh, right, they have fallen out. That has impacted the team dynamic here. Suddenly, the parents on the side and are no longer talking to each other. This parent then is talking to this club about moving. Then this whole external environment changes just off that 
one thing so then when all these other factors come into play it's such a wide range for us to be aware of we can't control everything it's literally so impossible but you know all we can do is try and create the best environment as possible try and keep that teammanship and, and that cohesiveness right there at all times because then regardless of whenever these issues do appear you know if they are there with those different personality types whether they want to have fun whether it's to come to football to get away from these issues then that's what it's all about and what it comes down to and you know it's so important that you you instill those within your sessions and it's great that you do so um but yeah the, it's, the it's now moving to under 19s i'm seeing more external factors of having young players of this age than i've ever seen before you know they're going out drinking they're partying they're having weekends away at festivals they they've got jobs they're playing seniors football then don't want to play youth football and or they might not be able to travel or they travel the day before they can't travel and there's an endless list so i don't even though i've got a team sheet i don't have that same team week in week out and even if i do <laughs> they're not the same people because their weeks have changed so many times right. and it, it, i've only had them six months but i've coached them before and i had uh, awareness of them but i'm seeing so many more factors impact them around their lives in terms of what's going on than i've ever seen before in any other group so whilst i'm seeing that it's also a learning curve for me then of how can i manage them how can i support them how does this look week to week and and all and how do we balance the group to complement what their needs are etc and it's so important for us then to try and manage that over a period of time yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. and just, just creating that safe environment. Like I, yeah, I like I coach girls. I've never coached boys before, before, so I don't know, I don't know how different that may be. I'm assuming it's probably a little different, but like making sure it's a safe space for our players. Um, like my girls know that they can talk to me about anything. It's an open door policy, but if it's something that I feel like we need to bring a parent in on the issue, like they know, like the the next call in that moment, I'm calling mom or dad and be like, hey, this is what's going on. We need to have a check in. We need to have a sit down. But pr providing that safe environment where they can come to practice and know that it's okay to have a breakdown. Like, oh, girls come out to the field and you think everything's fine, and you look at them and they start crying, and I'm like, well, what's happening? Like, I don't know. It's been a bad day. She's melting down, but they. They only, they only do that, do that because you create that environment where it's safe for them to do that, to have those emotional days or have a bad day and know that they're not going to get judged for it. So if we can do a better job creating those environments, knowing that they have all these things coming down, down the shoot at them, um, I think they're going to benefit from it and they're going to feel safe and they're going to feel protected and they're going to feel like it's an okay place to come and be vulnerable and be themselves. And that, that sort of relates to something that we and my assistant coach created. We created the Wolfpack mentality philosophy for one game. And then we took it into a, a team and we named a team after it. And then we went and founded the club. And there's currently a, a grassroots club that exists. It's currently in its second year of operation. Um, but it was all built on just something that we had for match day. And then it went right throughout the club and how we instilled it right from a young age, right, and th right through up. But it's about how they can have that safe environment where they don't, need to be judged because they already are so often by all the players spectators opposition etc then they have everything else going on in their lives whereas if they can come into training with their own teammates and it's like you know what we can protect each other we've got our arms around each other we're not going to leave anyone behind that's what the wolfpack mentality is then it creates that space which is you know amazing for them to have and have you know be available to themselves within that yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. And it's you know really important to keep building that, and as, as you've mentioned, it's about um, having that relationship and know, that bond that which I've seen you write about and have an article with with the players, which is so important. And I think you have to have a unique relationship with your players to have that bond with them, because not every coach can or will. And sometimes even if you have assistant coaches and you see one that has a better bond than you. They, that's okay as well because sometimes right, you might right. go oh he's got a better relationship or she does and you may feel like that's the worst thing in the world because you want the best bond with every one of your players but it's okay not to and sometimes again it's how these personalities complement each other so one coach may connect and get more of a, out of a player than you might and vice versa etc yeah yeah and i feel like that in the relationships like i have a player, a player that She's, a, She's a, just graduated, just graduated college, college, so I coached her six, six years, years ago. ago. I still talk to her on a fairly regular basis because we created that relationship and she knew it was safe. And I talked to her parents still, still and those, it's those relationships, like, that's what we're trying to build, um, right? So 
knowing, knowing that, that it's okay building those, those relationships. It's, it's, not, it's not easy, easy. Um, and, there is and there is that, that fine line, line, right? Like, I'm your coach. I'm, your coach. I'm, not, I'm not necessarily your friend, but I'm here for you, and we're going to do these things together. Um, so it's kind of drawing the line in the band, but still like having that openness and vulnerability about you so they continue to build those relationships. It's not easy. It's taken me a while to do it. Um, and, um, and to find out what works for me. So, like, I love, I love my, like, walk, walk and talks. Like, I can kind of read my players fairly really well, well, where if I see somebody struggling, but I got to go set up tones, like, hey, come with me, come here, let's go. Like, what do I do? Am I in trouble? Nope, I just want I just want to talk to you. I'll be set down tones, like, hey, what's going on? Like, you're not the same today, everything. Okay. Just those moments. And it doesn't have to be a 30 minute conversation. It's a 30 second check in. Like, hey, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. All right, you promise? Me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, cool. Go back to your friends. Or no, like, I'm, I'm having a bad day. All right, well, let's keep talking. I still got 10 more cones to set down. What's going on? Tell me about it. Like, what can I help? I may not be able to give you advice, but like, I'm going to listen. And then if there's something we need to take care of and tackle, like, I'll do my best as a coach to support you. And like, there's times that stopped in the, in the middle of what I was doing and picked up the phone and called a parent and be like, hey, this is what's happening. Like, you need to check on her as soon as she walks through the door. Or, hey, you need to get out to the fields right now. Like, this is, she's struggling and I'm worried about her. Um, which I think in turn, like, a parent's appreciate. And when you're appreciated by the parent, um, I think it kind of rubs off on the players because the parents now know, like, we're basically in charge of their most important thing in their entire lives. Like, like, we're in charge of their kids. For however, for however many hours a week you get, get. so they so want to know that you have, you have that vested interest and that you actually do care about their kid and their kid's well-being, um, at least here, here and how I feel, feel like with my team, like the parents, like the parents know that I care and I'll check in with the parents and the parents know that they can call me and having that relationship, not just with the players, but the parents, because we're in charge of their most important, like their prized possession, the thing they love the most in the world, their kids. We're, gonna we're in charge of them, we're and gonna we're going to see things that they're not going to let their parents see and let their parents know. So having that that relationship outside the field with the parents, so that they know that we're 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 hopefully creating that safe environment and trying to protect their kids and trying to help make their kids better people and working on their character. I think then helps because if you have your parents' support, the parents are helping you, which is helping the kids, which then now helps us on the field. So it's one big, like, plus it's a, it's a big family, right, is what it is. Like, the soccer community is a big family, and it's not just the players that you have to have those relationships with. It's their parents. It's maybe their grandparents. Like, I know some of my players' grandparents. Like, they'll come up after games to give me hugs and say, hey, so it's having that built in to the parents and the players like hey like, we we know this person's in it for the right reasons they're not just out here driving my kid and then walk away and doesn't care i think it's super important and i love that and it's that family family element which can be so important especially when we do have players who don't really have that background of a family environment so when we instill it between the team and then we have their parents carers grandparents etc involved it can be so much more and when they see us talking to their grandparents or parents they they really thrive off that and they can go do you know what our coach got a great relationship with, with my dad or mum and it can be really beneficial and then when it opens up those conversations because you've had those 30 second check-ins which I think is a top tip for any coach listening and to take away is that just 30 second conversation while you're setting out cones or just to check in or call a player over and it doesn't have to be 30 minutes and it doesn't have to be formal you don't have to sit down and have this you know across a desk or anything it can just be that 30 seconds which can be so important but can make such a difference and if they open up then you can certainly you know adapt to it and, and have that harness but when it comes down to it and, and and when it comes to sort of things like that and the coaching side what has been the biggest challenges then in that sense when which you might have faced as a coach so far wait, wait sorry can you say that again, the question again sorry yeah that's fine so uh so on the back of that, as much as we are supporting players and we can see that vulnerability and we are developing those relationships, it can be so difficult then on the flip side that we can face challenges ourselves. So what have, what has been the biggest challenges that you've faced so far as a coach? Biggest challenges? Um, personally, challenges. Like, just believing in myself, to be honest. Like, having that self-belief, like... Sometimes I feel like I just get into, like, this is my routine. This is just kind of who I am, and I just coach based on who I am. But then I step out and feel like, ah, I'm not good enough. Like, I don't, I don't think I'm doing the right thing. Um, so really that self-doubt 
it's been, it's been yeah, something I've struggled with and that belief that, that I'm doing, I'm doing the right thing, my players, players are performing well. well. We, may we may not be winning a national title. We may not be winning every single game we step out and play, but we're doing, we're doing the right things and we're playing the right way or what we deem as the right way, like our style. But even, but even at the end of the day, I'm just, I'm just not good enough. Like, am I really cut out for this? Um, so that's been a big one is that, that self, self-doubt self and believing in myself that I can do it. Um, another thing I struggle with is there's not a lot of female coaches. Right? Like, there's one other girl that is an assistant coach in our club. She coached for a while and she kind of took a step back. Um, there's, um, there's one girl that's now in our club that I just brought in that I'm kind of mentoring, but there's, but there's no, no female, I don't, I don't think I've coached against the female all season, all season. right? So, right? so having that camaraderie, like with other female coaches, it's very different. Um, like the guy, the guy coaches are coached against have been great. Like they haven't been, like, I know some people have had some really bad run-ins, some male coaches and we get refs that will go talk to my team manager, like, oh, hey, are you the coach? I'm like, no, hello, I'm over here. And the coach. And the coach. Um, so, so that I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a huge struggle, but it's definitely something I'm cognizant of and aware of. Um, and and that's, that's a bond, bond that like having, having female counterparts and people I can go and talk to um, that kind of go through the same things, things, things I do um, has been pretty tough. But I think overall, like that self doubt and self belief in what I'm doing is probably my biggest challenge as a coach. And it can be difficult then in, in, when it comes down to the, you know, that male-female you know, balance then in, in terms of what can be faced. And it can be so difficult then when you say you are in that club environment, there's only two of you, um, and you sometimes you don't have that little group to fall back upon because just having you know a female counterpart or a male counterpart just to talk to can be so important because you can relate to them, you can open up a bit more, and sometimes you can relate to a female in terms of your experiences a bit more easier than you can to a male. And what you're going for as females, you know, is interpersonal to you two compared to how a male, you know, will not see it because they're not a female to understand it. So it can be difficult then when you don't have someone to share those experiences with. And, you know, from a perspective, from a club environment, it can be tough for them for you to sort of have and deal with. And, again it can affect your motivation and can affect you know that's that self-confidence which you've spoke about um but then you know it's, it's you do have that self-confidence because you've been doing it for so long you are doing well um and, and you've created that great you know environment and relationship with players and parents in terms of what you do but when it comes down to it if i was to say what is one thing you love about coaching what would it be love about coaching Oh, there's so many things. I think it's the relationship. Um, I'm a very relational person. Um, I love helping people. I love getting to know people. Um, whether they're my players or players that play for a different coach. Like, we work um, the club I'm in, like, the guy that coaches the teams that are right below, so I have the two oldest. Him and I have a very good relationship, and I have a very good relationship with his assistant coach, which I've been blessed to have them in kind of my little community in my corner. But, but those relationships, relationships like, with his players, players even so they're not even my own players, but, like, hey, how was school today? Everything, everything good? good? Yeah. yeah. Or, like, them coming down the sidewalk and being, like, hey, coach, yeah. yeah. Like, those are, those are the moments I love. Like, I love building relationships, whether it's with players, whether it's with other coaches. Um, I'm a very relational-driven person. I like to have a community around me. So that's probably my favorite part is walking out to the field and having the sense of, like, community and people that – I get to, I get to impact and influence on a daily basis, not just as players, but as people as well. And hopefully I'm doing a good enough job that they're going to go out when they graduate and be good people in the society. And um, then their impact, right? it's like the snowball effect. You impact one player. Well, they take what you've done in their life, and now they're impacting somebody else who then takes it and impacts more people. So just having that relationship and building that relationship and that impact that you can have on one person that who knows how many people that will then turn into the impact that you've made so i love that's probably my favorite part about coaching and i love that and again it comes down to that human impact and that relationship which is so important to look at when we come down to the players and if i had to chuck that on a flip side what is one thing you dislike most about coaching that's a great question um, I don't, I mean, I love it all. Probably, like, I don't know, I don't feel like we've talked very tactical, but I love the tactical side of it, too, so, sexism, ooze. 
Um, um, sometimes, like, to be, like, to be, not to be, like, repetitive, repetitive but sometimes the relationships are hard. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's not, not fun trying, trying to deal with some of that stuff. Um, um, but I know that there is one thing where I'm just like, God, I hate this. I'm done, done with it. Uh, to be honest, like, I love what I do. I love going out to the field every day. Like, yeah, some days I'm like, hey, I need a break. I'm going to take a time out. I'm glad I'm on soccer for this weekend. I'm not going to watch the game. Like, cause it's so much when you do it seven days a week for an entire year. Like, you just do need to take a time out. But I don't know that there's one thing that I'm like, God, I hate this. Like, I just wish this could change. Um, um, cause just I just honestly, I love what I do. I love being on the field. I love being around people. I love, I love coaching the game because of what the game has given to me. So I, I, I feel like it'd be very hard to say that there's something I just like, don't like about the game. I love that. And if you had three words which anyone could describe you why by the time you finish coaching, what three words would they be? Um, influence, passion. passion and passion, uh, caring. caring. Love that. I love that. And the players are very lucky to have you off all these answers. If you could spend a day with any coach or manager, who would it be and why? Pat Guardiola, hands down. <laughs> yeah. um, um, I've always, always, always like, since the days of Barcelona, Barcelona um, I feel like I, like I don't obviously I don't know him. I only know what I see, but I feel like he is that kind of relational coach. Um, I love the way which he coaches and how he gets his points across. Um, I would just love to sit down and pick pick his brain. Um, like I try to watch things like him playing with inverted wingers. Like how how did you do that? Like how did you come up with that? Um, but also seeing like at the end of the game, like when they win a big game and his, par- his players like run to him and lift him up, like that's what shows me like his players care about him too. So he's got to be, there's got to be a relational style coach there. Um, but since his days at Barcelona, I've kind of been like that. I want to be like that guy. Um, so yeah, Pep Guardiola, hands down. Love that, love that. Good answer, a susceptible one for sure. <laughs> if you could coach in any country, where would it be? Ooh. All of them. I want to question all of them. Um, um probably, probably Spain or Italy? Italy? Maybe, Maybe Europe. Europe. I just want to. Like, I would love to coach everywhere. Like, I would love to go see it. Like, I don't think, I don't think I've ever actually thought of that question. question. Um. Probably more Spain because I feel like I'm more of a Spanish style. Like that kind of has creeped into like the way I coach a little bit. Um, a little more like the tiki taka style play, um, but possession with a purpose. So that probably fit into what I do and the way I like to coach a little bit better. But if somebody called me up from Birmingham, England today and said, hey, I want to fly you over. I got a team I want you to train for a year. I would jump on a plane today and do it. Like, I'm not going to say, nope. Wow. So I would, I would love to coach wherever, to be honest. Give, send me to a different country. Let me coach. Let me learn the culture. I think that would be awesome. I love that. And, you know, uh, I love that you would be willing to give up America for Birmingham, mine, but I think that's a great shout <laughs> if you ever want to take that jump. Um, if you weren't coaching, what else would you be doing? Ah, uh, if I wasn't coaching, I'd probably be studying more like sports psych kind of stuff. Um, if I could go back to university, I would have been study like sports psychology. Um, so I studied more sociology, which is like study people in groups. I would definitely dive into like the sports psych and try to get into the sport sports psych world. Brilliant. High-level professional footballer at the top of their game in in decent money or high-level coach at the top of their game in in decent money? Which one would you prefer to be and why? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I would probably say coach. I feel like I'd have more of an impact on people directly than as a player. Um, like I said, I'm a very relational person. Um... I think being, being a coach, you impact the players, the players immediately, immediately in front of you, where, like, if you're a high-paced player, player like, you're going to have an impact, you're going to have an influence, but 
how much, how much of a relationship do you really get with people? Like, I don't, I don't know the answer to that because I've never been a high paid professional athlete, right? Because all we see here and there, like, we see pictures and we see videos and we see Instagram, but like, what kind of relationships do you get to have when you're always in the spotlight? Maybe, Maybe you get to have great ones that, that I don't know, know, but I know as a coach, like, at least, at least you get to impact 20, 23 to 30 people every, every day as, as you're coaching them. I love it. If you could change football or soccer in any way, how would you do it and why? If I could change it. Like the game itself? Change anything. It can be up to you, whether you're changing a program or how players come through or competitiveness or... It could be anything. So you, you're like the god of football and you've got a free roam over whatever you could do. And it can be any aspect, any level. I would probably change. Hmm. Hmm. That is a tough one. Um, um, I'd, probably I'd probably change that you can't be on like an organized competitive team until you're like 14. Let them go play. play. You can't. You can't be, you can't be organized and competitive and trying to, win, trying to win trophies at six and seven, seven years old. Just go, just go out and play. So, that, like, so that, like fourteen is when you, is when you start the more structured environment. And again, it comes down to if you are playing competitive at six or seven and you're trying to compete for trophies, surely as a player, then you're going to be burnt out by fourteen, fifteen, and then you're going to be like, right, I've had right. enough of doing this. What's next? Right. Right. So it's that fine balance, and uh, I love that. So I know they definitely do it in Belgium, where they they only play competitive at under fourteens, and then you know in Germany they've started scrapping academies up until twelve. Um, so it's really interesting the concepts in terms of what they do abroad and how this sort of works. Um, but I was talking to a friend of mine, and he's uh, was studying for a PhD, and um, he he was talking about different personality types of coaches and how the game is going to evolve. So currently we have set piece piece coaches, which maybe didn't exist 30 years ago obviously we have fitness coaches um, and obviously then around it you have everyone else your psychologists your physios your fitness coaches but in terms of just looking at the coaching workforce itself it's definitely evolving and developing in in that aspect in terms of youth development phase foundation um, all these different areas but if you were to describe yourself as a certain type of coach whether it be a technical coach a tactical coach an all-rounded coach a fitness coach uh, maybe a goalkeeper coach uh, or a psychological coach which we feel that is going to be ingrained in the game in 10 years and be part of the coaching workforce what kind of coaching personality or type would you say that you are i'm probably more of a technical psychological coach um i love the technical side of the game i feel like tactically i'm fairly good until i get to the final third um and then we struggle with score goals because the final third is not my thing um, well, um, which I will admit anybody, to anybody if anytime they ask me. Um, so, so probably more of a, a technical, psychological kind of coach. Um, I love the technique. I love the, the small intricacies of like how to do certain things. Um, and there's obviously that relationship that I, I love. Um, but I think within that technical side, there's a psychology around it. Like, there's certain things you have to do, and if you get it wrong, like even it's a game of inches, right? So every little inch makes a difference. But being, but being able, able to like overcome, overcome that kind of stuff, so I'd think probably, probably more of a technical, psychological style of coach. And again, I love that. But then it does come back down to us as coaches in terms of understanding ourselves and where we're at. So, for example, I know I'd really struggle to be an assistant coach to someone because I've always been a lead coach and um, I, I, I just can't have it within me to be assisting someone i just really struggle with it i'm happy to do it i'm happy for them to lead on it and support and have that but if i had to do it over say a six month period and i was assistant i just know it wasn't within me because that's not my personality but you know if i had a day with if i had six months with pep guardiola i'd have you know no uh no no complaints (laughs) about it i'd just soak it up but when it comes down, it's, it's like, for example, when Alex Ferguson set up his teams, they said Rennie Mullerstein and all his other coaches would essentially do the tactical side of the game for him and then he would just have the, the management of it. So in that aspect, when, it, when I relate to you, it's that technical social, uh, psychological side, whereas I know where my tactical isn't where I'd like it to be. So if I had a tactical coach and I was current manager, which I am, if they wanted to do the tactical side, I'd be more than happy for them to do it because that's where their skill set would be. And I'd love to do all the other side of things. Whereas if that was on a flip then and I was then a coach and a manager like 
uh, Fergie where he had it set up in that sense where he would be happy to manage everything else and then I could go do the technical, the psychosocial with the players, then I know I would be happy to give up managing, being a manager then because I would find something as part of a, a larger workforce that would allow me to get the best out of my own skill set. So um, it comes down to us and understanding what works for us and you know we don't have to be professors in every area and i know if i could develop a side of the game it'd be you know technical so much more and i know managing now around the 19s is such there's a bigger technical element towards it and some weeks that my assistant coach has seen things that i haven't um and and I, that's because he's been in competitive football for the last 30 years whereas I've only been in and around it a little bit as a player and then it started to come out more as a coach part of my own journey now but I think it's really important to understand where we're currently at on our own development ladder and we don't have to get everything spot on and perfect as we mentioned previously within this uh, uh, chat yeah yeah, for sure I think you got to be, be, okay, be okay, okay knowing what you know, you know and, and use that, use that to your advantage we're, we're I see you need to know a little of the tactical side. You have to know a little of the set piece side. You have to know a little of the set piece side, but be comfortable knowing what you know and be okay admitting that you don't know things. Like, I don't know tactically. Like, I'm okay in the final third. I'm not great at it, but I feel pretty confident tactically like on the build-up to get us there, and then I would turn the reins over, like you said, if I had an assistant coach or if, some, some I was working with another coach and they were tactical like expert and I could do the technical piece to be like the dynamic deal right but I know I know what I'm good at um, and I know where I fall short and I'm always working to get better at it but I don't know that I'm ever going to be a great tactician because it's just not it's not how I see the game necessarily um so I think we as coaches have to be comfortable like this is what we're good at and hone in on that and how can you refine that while adding a little bit of the other elements in but being okay knowing that you're not going to be perfect and great in every single area of the game because i don't really think anybody is and that's again another key point which i'm just making note of uh, which is so important for coaches to reflect on um in terms of their own journey and who we are and where we're going to be at and how we need to learn and grow but you know it, it's been you know fascinating to have this hour with you and you know i you know, we definitely have to arrange it again in 2023 and do a technical side of things uh, i think that would be great and i think we'll have a technical battle off um i'll have, have a think about how we do that but you know the fact that we connected last night over social media and the next day we're doing it straight away i think just shows what a coaching community we are even if you are all the way out in america but it's great that you have been on and you know it's only a couple hours away uh, before the new year for me over here in Wales so you know it's, it just shows the commitment in terms of the game and, and where we're at but I'm so appreciative of your time and I'm so glad you come on and I know I've made you know three or four pages of notes off you and I know I'll watch it back <laughs> and make more off you but I really enjoy talking to you and I, I'm glad that we've connected but you know I hope you have a, a wonderful new year but I, I'm, I'm so thankful for your time yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love I love talking soccer, um, all parts of soccer. So anytime you want to talk soccer, just let me know. I'm happy to do it. Um, I was excited when I got the message. Okay, I want you on a podcast. Let's talk. I'm like, yeah, let's talk soccer. So I appreciate you reaching out and inviting me to be on the show. It's been it's been great. There's lots of takeaways for sure, um, and I look forward to doing it again sometime. Brilliant. No, definitely, we'll definitely get you back on. Um, but it'll be amazing. But uh, again, I'm really grateful and uh, happy new year to you. Thank you. So Thank happy you, sir. Happy new year. Thank you.